In this lesson, we're going to look at the fall of the European empires after the Second World War. Obviously, this was a huge and very significant event in world history in itself, or rather a succession of events. And it will also play into our next study of the Cold War. The Cold War was the ideological struggle between the communist Soviet Union and the Western capitalist states, principally the United States. Obviously, the fall of the European empires created a lot of newly independent states. And there was something of a struggle in some of those areas connected with the bigger struggle of the Cold War. So let's move on and look at the picture before 1945. You can see that large areas of the world, largely in Africa, South and Southeast Asia, were dominated by the European colonial empires. And we'll just look at that in a little bit of detail. Don't worry, you won't need to know every single country and which colonial power it was dominated by, but it would be helpful for your understanding to have a broad understanding of where the geographical area these imperial empires were. So let's begin by looking at Africa. You can see that large areas of West Africa were controlled by France, that was part of the French Empire. Large portions of Africa also were in the British Empire, Nigeria here, and this string of countries running down from Libya and Sudan right down to South Africa were part of the British Empire. The British also controlled South Asia, what would become Pakistan and India, and areas of Southeast Asia, Burma, Malaysia and Singapore were in the British Empire. The French also controlled an area they referred to as Indochina, that became Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, and the Dutch had a presence in what was called the Dutch East Indies, and which became Indonesia after independence in 1949. The Japanese had expanded a colonial empire in the latter half of the 19th and the 20th centuries. Korea was dominated by Japan, as was Taiwan. The United States, although it would deny being an, an empire, in some ways was an imperial power, as the Philippines was effectively a colony of the United States up to 1946. So what were the causes of the collapse of these European empires after the Second World War? Well, there are a number of factors that we could look at. One was the depression, the world depression of the 1930s. And many of the colonies, their large industry was producing raw materials for consumption and manufacture in the industrialized nations. Well, the price of raw materials fell massively during the Great Depression, and so there was a lot of poverty in the colonies. And clearly, when people exist in poverty, when they are poor, they're not going to be happy with their rulers. Another factor was that during the Second World War, the Japanese conquest of much of Southeast Asia, it demonstrated that the Europeans could be beaten. They were not invincible masters, and this helped to foster feelings towards independence. Britain and France themselves, after the Second World War, had a lot of economic problems. They were heavily in debt after the war, and they needed to focus on rebuilding their own national economies. The cost of maintaining a large international empire was a lot, and Britain and France would struggle to pay that after the Second World War. There was also a rise in nationalism in the colonies. This stretched to way back before the Second World War. There was a, a rising independence movement in many nations where peoples, native peoples, felt they had the right to rule and to govern themselves, not to be ruled by a foreign master. In the old imperial powers themselves, within Britain, France and some of the other imperial powers, there was a decline in imperialist feeling. Back in the 19th and early 20th centuries, many British people, for example, would have been proud of the empire. But by the middle of the 20th century, many people's attitudes were changing and they felt that it was wrong that they should dominate and control colonies abroad. So there was a decline in imperialist feeling. So let's start to look at the process of decolonization. In some cases, this was a peaceful handover from imperial control to independence, and in other cases, it was marked by war. So, in 1946, Syria and Lebanon gained their independence from France. They had actually previously been part of the Ottoman Empire and handed over to France as mandates after the First World War. 
The Philippines gained its independence from the United States in 1946, and Indonesia gained its independence from the Dutch in 1948. In 1947, what would become India and Pakistan gained its independence from Britain. There was actually something of a period of violence uh, when the, what was British India separated into India and Pakistan. One of the heroes of the Indian independence movement, regarded as a hero in India certainly, was this man, Mahatma Gandhi. He was an ex-lawyer and he became a champion of the peace, the independence movement, and he wanted to achieve independence from the British Empire by non-violent means. He was a champion of non-violent struggle. In the same year as Indian independence, Burma and Sri Lanka also achieved their independence. Let's move on to Africa now. So really back in the 19th century, Africa had been sliced and diced. It had been cut up like a giant cake effectively between the European powers. So Belgium was the first European power to begin an imperialism within Africa and it was actually the Belgian Congo, which became Zaire in 1960, was the first African country to achieve independence. Shortly afterwards, throughout the 1960s, most of the French colonies in West Africa and the British colonies running down Central Africa, down to South Africa, they achieved their independence. Uh, there was a war in Algeria. Algeria was a French colony. Uh, and a lot of French people had settled there many, for many generations. And so there was actually quite a vicious civil war between 1954 and 1962. And it was in 1962 that Algeria achieved its independence from France. Portugal was actually ruled by a dictator until 1975. And so it wasn't until 1975 when Portugal itself achieved a democracy that the colonies of Angola and Mozambique also achieved independence. Looking down towards the southern part of Africa, what was called Rhodesia, again was dominated by a large settled white population which owned a lot of land and the infrastructure. And Rhodesia finally achieved independence in 1980, although it's had a very troubled history since then. South Africa, uh, achieved its independence from the British Empire in 1910, but was ruled and dominated effectively by the white settled minority up to 1994, when in 1994, South Africa effectively became a democracy. There's a picture there of uh, Nelson Mandela, the leader of the ANC movement uh, uh, in 1994, when South Africa actually became a democracy. So let's look at Indochina. If you remember, Indochina was the French term for Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. The French were very reluctant to lose these colonies. They wanted to keep hold of Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam. There was an independence movement, many of whom were communists, and they waged war against the French, trying to achieve independence from the French colonial empire. In 1954, the French suffered a heavy defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam, and they withdrew from Vietnam in that year. Vietnam was then divided, and the USA propped up. It helped with economic and military aid, a pro-Western government until 1975, when Vietnam was unified under a communist regime. After the fall of the empires, there were some after effects, some of which could certainly be blamed on the empires themselves. Not all of them. There were some problems resulting from the artificial boundaries created by the European empires in Africa itself. Africa, as I say, had been carved up like a giant cake, effectively, in the 19th century between the European powers. And if you look at the borders of many African countries, they're not like the borders of countries which tend to run along geographical boundaries like mountains or rivers or so on. They're artificial boundaries. If you look at them, there's lots of very straight lines. Look here at the border between Mauritania and Mali, between Libya and Chad. Go down to southern Africa, look at the borders between Angola, Namibia and Botswana. These extremely straight borders sometimes brought 
rather hostile ethnic groups together in the same country, and sometimes they separated people from the same ethnic group, leaving some in some country and a minority in another country. This has certainly led to ethnic unrest since the fall of empire, and some, not all, of the problems of Africa can certainly be traced back to the imperial occupation. Another problem for many ex-colonies is that they were relatively underdeveloped economies. They were not industrialised and they rely on exports of raw materials. And if there's a fall in the price of those raw materials, the people within those countries can suffer. Let's look at Europe after empire. Although Europe, during the imperial phase, presented itself as a beacon of civilization, it's important for us to remember that two of the horrifying and devastating conflicts of the 20th century actually had their roots inside the European continent. After World War II, however, there was a decline in the power of Britain and France before they still had some claims to be major world powers, but they really declined in power after as their empires were dismantled and what was replaced what replaced those old empires was something called the european community it's not that europe is ruled by one single government but there was a closer integration a bringing together of the european economies and some degree of political integration as well although the european countries are independent they're certainly more united now in the european community and although there was a, a war in the Balkans in the 1990s, the Europe of today, it looks very unlikely to be a place where any major conflict will break out between the European countries. It is still a, a major global economic player comprising a quarter of the world global economy. Let's look now at something which is going to be helpful to us when we look we move on in our, in our next unit of study towards looking at the Cold War. And this is what happens to these newly independent countries. So there's lots of newly independent countries have been created. And there, there's a question. There are two superpowers in the world now, the communist USSR and the capitalist democratic United States. Well, are these new countries, are they going to align, which means to side with the United States? Or are they going to side with the Soviet Union? And sometimes both the United States and the Soviet Union offered a lot of money and aid for countries to side with them. This happened in places like Korea and Vietnam. There was, however, something called the Non-Aligned Movement, which started in 1961. This was a grouping of countries in the post-war world which tried to keep independent from the superpowers. This is one of the first, this is a postcard from one of the first meetings of the non-aligned movement. At the top you've got Tito of Yugoslavia, the Sukarno of Indonesia, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt and Jawaharlal Nehru of India. So some countries did try to avoid getting caught up in Cold War alliances. Well, I hope that's been reasonably useful. Let's have a look at a summary. So after 1945, the world really dramatically changed as the European empires collapsed. There were some post-imperial problems, as many of the colonies had very underdeveloped economies, and there were artificial boundaries, for, a plate, for example, in Africa. The European community formed, and Europe became re essentially really very peaceful after the Second World War, after really hundreds, even thousands of years of constant warfare. And there's a question with some of the newly independent countries, are they going to align or side with either the United States or the Soviet Union? And how is this going to worry the United States and the Soviet Union as they see countries moving one way or the other? Okay, I hope you've made some notes on that and good luck with the quiz questions.